good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for Winning the Battle Against Bed Bugs, presented to you by Hotel Business and Western Pest Services. I'm Nicole Carlino, Senior Associate Editor for Hotel Business, and I'm here with Hope Bowman and Shannon Sked, uh, who are both board certified entomologists with Western Pest Services. Hope serves as technical, technical specialist with the company and Shannon as the specialty services manager. Uh, today's presentation is designed to provide insight on the latest in bed bug monitoring, detection methods and solutions. Um, as a bit of housekeeping, we encourage all of you to send us any questions you have at any point during the discussion and those will be either answered during or directly after. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Hope and Shannon, our experts. Okay, good afternoon. Um, we're going to start out just talking about some did you know facts and things that might be interesting for you as hotel um, associates. So one thing is one out of five Americans have either had an infestation of bed bugs or know someone who has. Probably you guys being in the hotel field probably know a whole bunch of people who have had them or know a little bit about that. So that's one fact. Another one, this is probably more interesting for those that are on the operations end for sure, is the University of Kentucky study reported that a single report of bed bugs in a recent traveler review will lower the value of a business hotel room by up to $38 per room per night. So what that means is if you go on an online you know, trip advisor or something like that and there's a report of bed bugs at your hotel, your price of the room is going to decrease by $38 on average. Um, so if we do some math for that, if you multiply that, say you have 100 rooms and all the rooms have dropped $38 because of these really bad reviews, you're looking at $3,800 potentially a night. If you multiply that by 300 nights of occupancy, that's a lot of money, like over a million dollars potentially that you can lose because of a single report. Um, so another thing that can be a real problem is this for your business is the bed bug registry. I'm sure you all know about it, probably keeps good tabs on what's been going on at your locations, but there's over 20,000 reported sightings covering 12,000 locations. Again, if you take that $38 a night decrease um, in the potential cost of your hotel for the night, that if you average it for a hotel that has 100 rooms, that's $76 million per day for your industry over just for one day that these sightings could potentially be costing. So this is something to really um, keep in mind when you're dealing with bed bug issues and how to prevent these potential problems. So a lot of times we think about bed bugs being brought in by guests, and they certainly are brought in by guests. They're very good hitchhikers, so they will come in on folks' bags when they come in. They may not even know them that they've gotten them at a previous hotel or brought them from their house. Um, but there's also other ways they can be brought in. So laundering vendors, if you look at this cart here, it's got these nice wheels that bed bugs can hide in. It's got the canvas from the basket that they can hide in. So there's other vendors that also can be bringing them in. So making sure you also take that into account when you're looking for bed bugs, trying to make sure you detect them early enough. So we're going to talk about just meeting the bed bug. Um, so adult bed bugs are about an eighth of an inch long. They're reddish brown. They resemble unfed ticks, sometimes small cockroaches. We've gone into different places where they've had cockroaches and not realized they've also had bed bugs because they look very similar when they're young. They're oval shaped, very flattened unless they're engorged with blood. Um, so the bottom left-hand picture, that's the one that's just fed. So that one's a lot more plump, not as flat can't hide in as many little tight spaces as possible. Um, they don't have wings, but they do have wing pads. So if you have a guest that comes to you and says that something's jumping on them, that's not going to be bed bugs. If something's flying, that's also not going to be bed bugs. They just crawl. They don't jump. They don't um, fly, anything like that. So I want you all to remember this slide when we're talking a little bit later about the canines. Because this slide is very important when you take a look at that, especially all of the nymphs, which are the small baby bed bugs that are over towards the right. Um, those are the ones that we really want to, that the canines are going to become important. And Shannon will talk about that in a little bit. So why do bed bugs love hotels? Well, hotels are kind of one of these ideal places for them. There's um, high overnight occupancy. You've got a lot of people that are living in, that are in the hotel, and that's the food for the bed bugs is people. 
Um, so if you think about a house, uh, house square footage wise, they also have a kitchen, a living room, maybe a den, something like that. And hotels, pretty much you're dealing with just bedrooms, a whole bunch of different bedrooms. And those bedrooms are really what bed bugs really ideally like because that's where the people are going to be sleeping and where the food is. So bed bugs also love hotels because you all have these really nice headboards. And headboards are perfect because they're right up against the wall for bed bugs. They've got these nice little spaces behind them where they can hide. So bed bugs really only need the space of where a business card can slide. So if you think about a headboard, there's this nice little space behind there where they can hide. The headboards stay in one place. They're not moved around like some of the other furniture might be. So that's a good place for them to hide. So that's another reason they like hotels. The other reason is that people sleep over. So you have a frequent turnover of the victims of that are unfortunately your guests that are coming in. So people may not realize that they've been bit and then they will leave and go on to go home or go to another hotel. And in that amount of time, the bed bugs were able to go back into hiding and then a new victim, so to speak, comes along the next day. And so that's another reason they can go undetected for some time if someone does not um, report them to you. So let's talk about who's inspecting your rooms. Um, so you could have your pest control vendor can be inspecting the rooms. You may have canine. Um, you're also going to have your housekeeping. You may have your maintenance staff. Anyone who's in the room doing maintenance might be inspecting it. And then also your guests. And, just, and you've got to just always keep in mind that your guests are going to be inspecting for bed bugs also. And just remember about this cost per night discussion that we talked about a little earlier, that it's important that, you know, not the guest is the one that finds the bed bugs, but that the pest control vendor, the canine, or the housekeeping or maintenance, those are really better to find them than guests that are coming. So here are some common harborage spots for bed bugs. Like I said before, they like to hide in cracks and crevices. So they're kind of the opposite of claustrophobic. They want to be in tight spots. They don't want to be out in the open. So if they're out in the open, they're going to be trying to find a place to hide if they end up out in the open. So places in hotel rooms that they like to hide are the mattress, the box spring, the frame for the bed. If it's a platform bed, they have a lot of places to hide around any of the little components of it, any of the parts that hold the bed up. Um, wallpaper, nightstands, drawers, any sort of window moldings around the curtains. Um, near the switch plate, in any sort of furniture. So if there's an ottoman, there's places they can hide. If there's a chair, they're going to hide, you know, underneath the cheesecloth area there, inside in between cushions. There's lots of places for them to hide in hotel rooms. So these are places that, you know, you're not going to be able to look all the time, but these are places if there's a complaint that usually the pest control vendor will look for them. So the sta your staff is really the front line of defense against finding bed bugs and finding them more quickly than your guests do. Um, so there's several things that you may want to do is make sure that your housekeeping employees are educated about this. There's information sheets out there. Pest control vendors may do information sessions like we do for the hotel housekeeping staff. And this is a very important part of your line of defense because it's systematic, it's controlled, it's ongoing. You have someone in there every single day that's changing linens, that's doing different things. So this is an important part. So um, it's also important to remember that guests also perform inspections. So this is actually one of our coworkers, um, brother-in-law, who learned from her about what you need to do to inspect for bed bugs and sent this picture to her because he was actually inspecting for bed bugs at a hotel on the way to the airport. So we teach people, we, we have information that we give out to our home service customers, lots of information is available online, and your guests are definitely doing these inspections. Um, so next what we're going to talk about, I'm going to turn this over to Shannon, and he's going to talk um, a little bit about another inspector that comes along. Okay, so um, one of the ways that we can actually inspect is the use of canine, and it's, uh, it's something that has a, a lot of discussion around the industry as to whether it's effective or not effective. Um, the use of the canine is actually, and the training of the canine is exactly the same. We're using the same techniques and everything that's used for other functions, such as narcotics dogs, bomb sniffing dogs, um, even the USDA's cheese dogs that are at the airports. Um, 
In 2008, Pfizer and her team in, in um, University of Florida actually did some studies on different methodologies of training dogs. And what they found was the dogs can be upwards of 92% or better effective at actually locating bed bugs if they follow certain training methodologies. And this is really, at the end of the day, this is why they work. This graph here is a population curve of the different stages of the bed bugs. If you look at the solid lines, the blue line is actually the adult um, growth over 180 days in optimal conditions, and that it's just population production. The green line is exactly the same, but those are the, the nymphs, and the red line or the dark red line is the egg. One of the things that you can see right away is that the adult is actually a small part of the entire bed bug population. Unfortunately, if you think all the way back to the slide that Hope was uh, showing you, that had the picture of all the different stages, the adult is also the most visible stage of bed bugs. It's usually what's seen by guests um, when you get a phone call. There's a couple of papers that were put out in the early 2010s, um, late 2000s, uh, that were really focusing on the different ways that you look for bed bugs or find bed bugs or treat for bed bugs. And what they found was that the human, the, the ability to actually visually see this small fragment of the population which is as low to 5 to 7 percent visually by humans, usually occurs after the optimal time for treatment. And because of that, a lot of times by the time that we have a visual inspection, we're really behind the gun on taking care of the problem. What we found with canines through the research that Pfizer and her team did was it, it actually, these dogs can find them in very, very low numbers, as low as when they first form, when, they, when you first have an introduction of a brand new individual bed bug no infestation yet, just a hitchhiker that fell off. So we know that the dogs are effective, and not only are they effective, but they're effective in small enough numbers where we can find them before we miss the window of opportunity for effective treatments. The morphology of the dog is the reason why, why they work, or how they work, and they have a lot of different pieces to their anatomy of their sinus cavity that's very different from ours. There's, there's things like the ethnotermites, that, which are actually in the yellow. They have this this little flap that allows them to separate their breathing mechanism from their smelling mechanism. Um, just different pieces in their sinus cavity that we don't have. The other thing is that we have about 5 million olfactory receptors. Canine in the region all over the place, but it's somewhere around 250 million olfactory receptors to upwards of 500 million. So it's almost a, anywhere from a 50 to 100 fold uh, difference in olfactory receptors. And where that comes into play is, okay, so what that means well, I always use my McDonald's scenario, and I'm going to give you the McDonald's scenario. The McDonald's scenario is with 5 million olfactory receptors, when I walk into a McDonald's, I have a, I have a very unique odor recognition, and I smell McDonald's. I don't smell Burger King. I don't smell anything else. A lot of people, when I ask them, what do you smell when you walk into a McDonald's, they'll say fries, grease, burgers. Well, the truth of the matter is that McDonald's smells like McDonald's. With 5 million olfactory receptors, I take all of the various odors that are in that, that restaurant, and it kind of mixes them all together, and I have one experience with that odor. My dog, if I bring the dog in or near McDonald's, what my dog will actually smell is she will smell uh, a sesame seed, a bun, a bird, a cheese. If she could talk, she could tell me all the ingredients that are in the Big Mac sauce. With 250 million olfactory receptors, what she's able to do is what's called scent differentiation. She can break apart all of those odors and experience all the individual components separately. What we do with the canine world for bed bugs, very, very simple, and it's the same as done in any of the other scent detection work, is we positively train the dog on one specific odor. In this case, it is the bed bug pheromone. And the bed bug pheromone is actually produced by the bed bug. It's an aggregate pheromone. It allows the bed bugs to find each other. Um, science has shown that the, the that bed bugs actually like to be in close quarters with each other up to a certain population size. They survive better. They reproduce faster when they're in tight quarters. So they like to find each other. So they produce this, this aggregate pheromone um, that allows them to find each other. What we believe is happening is the dogs are actually picking up on at least part, if not all, of the components of the aggregate pheromone. Um, and it, this actually is shown by our dogs being able to smell fresh um, cat skins, live bed bugs, and eggs as well. So these dogs do work. We think we know what they're finding. Um, Greece and her team put this, this paper out in 2015 that explains what the constituents of the aggregate pheromone are. 
There was another one that was put out in 2016 by Cho just, just two months ago, um, explaining that these pheromones, part of these pheromones are still found in the caskin, and it, 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 it replicates exactly what we find our dogs are actually finding when we take them out into the field and have them do search work. But with that, so we, now we, we've actually talked about, you know, visual inspections using um, our staff to try to find problems, guests might be, be bringing problems to us, and the use of proactive monitoring using the canine. So what do we do once we have a, 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 an active infestation? And so I'm going to turn it back to Hope, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So probably the most challenging situation that you all have to deal with is the guest interaction. So the scenario is that the guest finds a vet bug, and what are the steps that you take to address that issue? So first things first, don't panic. I know that's probably your first reaction is to panic, but you have to try to fight that and try not to panic. Um, so especially if this is the first time you've dealt with that, it may help to have, just be prepared, getting educational sessions like this will help out, um, and making sure that everyone who is at the front desk is trained in how to respond if this situation occurs. So the first um, step is to just kind of put yourself in the customer's shoes and think about how you would want to be treated if you had the same situation go on. So just think about that as if you get, a, get someone that brings this to you. So there may be some things that you can do to try to help out your guest that comes there. Um, so one thing you may suggest is that they move to a new room. Um, and if they do move to a new room, the other, op the other thing that you're going to have to work with is their items that they have with them. So their bags, their clothing, things like that. So another option you can do is to offer to launder or dry clean their items. Um, there's also a, a product that we use called Thermostrike Heating Unit that um, it's hard to sort of see the size from this picture here, but basically an entire suitcase will fit inside of there. It gets zipped up. It's plugged in and it heats it up to over 122 degrees, which is what is needed to kill all life stages of the vet bugs. So these are some customized solutions you can give your guests that are coming in so that they can feel comfortable with not taking them home, not bringing them to the next area they're going, things like that. So the other thing is if somebody comes to you with bites. So you cannot tell by just looking at a bite on someone's arm, whether it's a mosquito or a reaction to the detergent that's in your sheet that they're not used to having because they use a different one at home or if they came in contact with some other sort of insect um, or if they come in contact with bed bugs. So just confirming for sure looking at the bites is not, a, is not really the way to confirm that there are bed bugs. Now these um, bed bug bites we happen to know are definitely bed bug bites because this is Shannon's arm. Shannon has a whole colony of these little babies that he takes care of and feeds and makes sure that they're all ready for the canines so that they can be trained. So this is what his arm looks like when he is bit by bed bugs. Other people have different reactions. About 70% of people have absolutely no reaction the first time they're bit. Some people get very strong reactions, but this is what Shannon looks like after he's been bit by that bug. So the most important thing to do when you are working with your guests is realizing that these guests are going to be sharing their customer experiences with others. So really your main goal is to try to make sure that these guests don't immediately get on their phone, immediately go to bed bug registry, and immediately slam your hotel. So the best experience that they have in you responding to them, making them feel better about having had this experience, the least likely they are to go on the bed bug registry, to tell all their friends, to go on Facebook and Twitter and every other sort of thing out there. So if you can limit their negative experience and try to replace it with a good experience, that's the best thing you can try to do. So the more you can try to make them feel better about the experience and that you responded, the better off you're going to be. So after you determine that you have a, an issue with bed bugs, you want to know what your staff should do with the room. So you walk into a room like this that somebody's found bed bugs, they've maybe slept in overnight. Um, what we recommend is that you leave everything in place. You don't remove the linens, you don't remove anything out of the room, you just leave everything in place so that we can see exactly what was going on and determine what the situation was. 
So what you want to do is then contact your pest control provider and really work with your pest control provider once you find that you have a situation with bed bugs. Um, so typically there'll be a prep sheet that needs to be done that your pest control provider will give you. Make sure that you follow that as best you can. Um, the better the preparation, the better you're going to be at getting rid of the problem. Um, work as a team with your pest control um, provider. So if he or she gives you suggestions, make sure that you take those suggestions. If there's anything else that you can provide them with and he can provide you with, that would be good. Um, and then also allow the time needed for doing the treatment. So typically there's not going to be one treatment, there's going to be at least one follow-up, perhaps two follow-up treatments, so not putting that room back into rotation. So if you put it back into rotation, well, yes, you'll get the money from the guests, you put yourself at risk that someone else will find one in between the treatments. We'll find a bed bug. And then just allow the pest control um, provider to do their targeted treatments. Make sure they can get access and get in there and make sure that there's not your staff around because it's going to work best if they're not around while doing the treatment. So ultimately, you're also trying to prevent being a headline. So these are some recent headlines that were in the hotel industry recently, and these are big numbers. You know, they're not any little tiny amount out there that can be, there's definitely more and more bed bug lawsuits popping up every day. So anywhere from 71000 to $7 million for bed bug issues. So the main thing here is that you want, we want to work on being proactive rather than reactive to bed bugs. I think traditionally in, in most industries, it's been a reaction that we've had to bed bugs. You find a bed bug, you react to it, you treat it. But really being proactive to prevent that in the first place is going to be important. And I'll switch it back to Shannon so we can talk a little bit more about that. So part of being proactive is um, this tool that we have going back to the canine. We talked a little bit about the science in the canine, but if they're not utilized the correct way, they're really, first of all, they, they can be ineffective if they're not trained right, if the handler isn't trained right, or if you have a, a dog that's trained correctly, you have a handler that's trained correctly, but they're not utilized in the correct fashion, they can also be ineffective. The way that the canine is really designed to be utilized is as a proactive monitoring tool. And a lot of the science that's coming out is actually it keeps on reinforcing this. We're seeing that at University of California, Riverside, Florida, Rutgers University, a lot of the research that's being done by the, our, our um, extension entomologists and research professors, they're all saying the same thing. This building-wide approach to canine management, understanding where the root problems are, it really requires you not to just go one room at a time, but to do full floor sweeps or full building sweeps and do it on a proactive frequency. And that's what this, um, the, the canine teams are really designed to do. They can be much more faster than a visual inspection. We know that when they're trained correctly, they can be much more effective than a visual inspection. Um, so it should be this full sweep of the building. And once you have that in place, the, thing that, the way that this should be utilized, your program should be set up, is it should be a proactive monitoring system. It should be on some type of a routine inspection program. So not after you think you might have a problem, but on some type of regular occurrence, either monthly or quarterly. Um, for the hotel industry, I wouldn't go too far beyond quarterly. And then once a massive infestation is resolved, can I find the smallest recurrence for treatment uh, for quick tr treatment? So if one is missed or if it was in another room, we can actually isolate where the root problems are coming from rather than just retreating a room over and over and over again, which is really a waste of money without finding the root problem. And it should be a part of the overall bed bug management program. So that's your full hotel bed bug management plan that you have in place. This canine or some type of a, a proactive inspection should be a part of that program. So what should you look for if you're looking for an effective canine program? Well, the problem with canine is there is no regulations on this. So there is no standard um, it is probably the best. There's nothing that says that this is a trained dog and this is not a trained dog legally. Um, so you have a great variety of programs that are available to you out there. And of course, some of them are really good and some of them aren't so good. What I would suggest looking for from a canine program is it should be based on science. Um, there should be a back, backbone to everything that is done in your, your pest control provider's canine program that's based off of actual research. The other thing is that it should be based on training, um, daily training of, of the dogs and training of the handlers. 
Uh, if it's a, a canine professional, they need to be trained in bed bugs. If it's somebody that comes from the pest control side that's getting into the dog, then they'll need to be trained on how to properly take care of dogs. But you should have training on both sides of the team. The other thing is certification evaluation program. You want to look at that. You want to look at that very strongly. And then our handlers versed in canine and bed bugs. The reason why I say that is they need to understand the dog, but even as important, they need to know what to look for because they should be doing some type of visual verification of all the alerts. It doesn't mean that they're going to find something every time. Once the dog alerts, it alerts and it's considered a positive indication, but you should be looking for trends. If you have 10 alerts over a two-month period and not a single thing has been found, well, you might want to question if the dog's working well. If you have 10 alerts and six, six of those alerts have had visual verifications, well, I always call that the the equipment is calibrated. We know that that dog is working and working well. And one of the most important things has to do with what we talked about in the last slide, the certification regime. There is no, outside of Maryland, there is no law on what's considered a certified canine handler team. And there's a lot of different programs that are available out there. NASDAQ, WCDO, ASA Anderson, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot. So what makes a good training and certification program? Well, the industry standard is at least one third party audit once a year. And my argument to that would be, I would bet that if a dog passed a certification test uh, yesterday, I would put odds from here to Vegas that that dog was gonna work just fine today. No problems whatsoever, it's been tested, we know that dog is working. However, a month or two months from now, maybe I would put odds from here to Atlantic City, I wouldn't put a lot down though. Um, I start questioning whether or not that dog is still working. And then three months from now, I have no clue. So what we do at Western is we came up with actually a, a, a three-way certification and in-service evaluation program where our dogs are, are every single quarter, they get a full evaluation by our master trainer, who's an independent consultant. We do two tests a year. It's an internal certification program. So every six months, our dogs are getting full tested. And that's also done by our master trainer. And then we have a third party outside auditing system that we use, it's our true certification that's done by a third party auditor and that's done once a year. So our program includes seven times of somehow looking, certifying, testing and evaluating these dogs in addition to the daily training that they receive from their handlers. So that being all said and done, we're at the uh, conclusion of the program for today. Um, I will turn it back over at this point and see if we have any questions or any comments that we'd like to address? Excellent. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Um, is uh, where can you find information on how to get services from a canine that detects by bugs if needed? Well, what you, what, unfortunately, because there is no real regulations out there, it's really dependent on which auditing system or certification body you would be interested in, in looking at. And there's several out there. Some of them include NASDECA, um, WDDO. There's some local ones like Lisa Anderson. And you can actually go onto their website and look for certified teams. Um, it, unfortunately, it doesn't give you their date certifications. It tells, just tells you a lot of them to tell you if they're active or not. The next question, um, what should a hotel do if a guest comes and said that she got, um, so you're not 100% sure, but there's just suspicion? What's the usual protocol for this? So I would say the best thing to do is um, move them to a, sec a different room just so that you're able to get in there and have your pest control provider also take a look at the room. Any of their items, if you can either put them in that heat chamber or wa launder or dry clean their items just to make them feel better about where their, that their items that they're bringing in there. That, that would be the best thing to do is to try to move them to a different room and make them feel good about the items that they have with them. And then you can investigate. Um, next question. Um, are there preventative measures that hotels can take when renovating or doing new construction? Sure. So the best thing with bed bugs is to try to eliminate the number of places that they can hide. So if you have more little gaps and cracks and crevices where they can hide, that's going to make them more likely to hide for longer so that you they go undetected for longer and to um, have your housekeeping not be able to see them for a longer period of time. So when you're remodeling, make sure that all molding and are sealed with caulk. Any headboards, simple is better. 
So those really ornate headboards that have a lot of little cracks and cran crooks and crannies and things, that's something to try to avoid. Clean line, sleek furniture is going to have less cracks and crevices, so trying to do that is going to help. Um, even thinking about things like the dust ruffles that are on, on beds, ones that have a lot of ruffles are going to have more potential places for them to hide. Ones that only have a few creases are going to be better, too. The materials that are used in construction too can also have an impact. Two that have come to mind include popcorn ceiling and wallpaper. Um, those are two two materials that actually produce a lot of crack and crevice environment for the bed bugs to hide in. So uh, as 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 Hope was mentioning, just like the furniture, smoother surfaces, uh, less nooks and crannies, and, and places for them to hide, the better it is. So that you need to look at that and how you're actually doing the design as well as what materials you select. Excellent. Um, so next question. Um, what are a few questions that I can ask my pest management provider to uh, make sure they're addressing all these concerns? Um, so some of the questions that I would ask them, if you're using a pest management provider for canine, ask these questions that Shannon spoke about. So ask about their training, ask about their ongoing certification. Um, another thing I would definitely ask your provider is if what sorts of resources they have for you to help educate your employees. So if there's any sort of handouts that can be given to their to housekeepers or maintenance staff, any in-service training that can be done, all of those will help you out as well. And then the other thing that I would definitely ask too is what do they want you to do if you find a room that has potentially has bed bugs in it? Um, some things that we usually recommend is to have the save the bug, don't flush the bug, because that way we can I, figure out definitely what we're dealing with, because it would be terrible to have to deal with the room thinking it's a bed bug when it was just a common beetle that came from the outside. So saving the bug, we make sure that all the items are kept in the room, nothing's taken out. Those are some things we recommend. That might be just something you'd want to ask your pest management provider. The other piece that I think is really critical is kind of what we're doing here. Um, your pest management provider should be asking if they have the capability of doing some type of education for whether it's your housekeeping staff or your maintenance staff um, or for just general managers and et cetera. But uh, the more communication, the more education, the more that people are talking about the problem and then taking those things that you learn and making them a part of your hotel bed bug management plan, the better you're going to be prepared to deal with the situation if it arises, and even better, the more likely you're going to have a proactive program that's going to help you to identify small problems rather than trying to put out big fires. Let's see. If you do have bed bugs, do you have to throw out all the soft goods? Um, you know, what has to go no matter what? We don't really have anything that has to go no matter what. So most soft goods can be washed and dried if it needs to be washed. Otherwise, it can just be dry. The drying will kill all life stages of the bed bugs. Um, we may recommend if there's a mattress that's very torn and we believe that there's bed bugs inside, we may recommend getting rid of that. But there's other options such as fumigation that may also be able to be utilized also. So there's, in most cases, you don't have to throw anything out. Um, but it's really up to the pest provider and what sort of situation you have going on there. You've mentioned that there are different ways that uh, bed bugs can get into hotels. Are there uh, differences in, in a pattern of an infestation um, or ways to figure out the cause um, so this way you know if it is a vendor who brought it in? Unfortunately not. The, um, the initial introduction is really irrelevant as, as far as what's going to happen during the infestation of the population growth cycle. Uh, all that's needed for an introduction to turn into an infestation is a female that's capable of producing eggs. Um, after that, once the female drops off of, let's say it was a laundering bag from a vendor, let's say it was a, a suitcase from a, a guest or, or um, you know, an employee uh, with her purse, once that bed bug, that, that female that has eggs, drops off, uh, she'll go and look for a nook and cranny, a hiding spot. That's that's part of their nature. And they'll wait for nighttime to come back out to feed. And during that time, they're going to be starting a population somewhere. So, no, there really is no rhyme and reason. I cannot go into any room, take a look at an infestation, and say, aha, this must be from you know this type of introduction. Um, it, it, there's too many variables to be able to do that. Are there any... Um Final questions or, or Hope Shannon, do you have any other final thoughts you'd like to share? 
Well, I think the, um, the most important thing is the most recent science has come out from multiple sources has that building-wide management of bed bugs is the key for successful bed bug management. Um, they are here. We are going to have to be dealing with them. So, you know, full eradication and 100% prevention is just uh, un un unattainable. But that being said, if we do have some type of a proactive monitoring system in place, if we do have a bed bug management plan that shows roles and responsibilities and how people are supposed to react from both the, um, the hotel side as well as the pest control provider side, and if we have everybody communicating throughout that entire process, the ability to actually manage this problem becomes something that's more attainable. Um, you know, we have one more question. Uh, can you comment on the effectiveness of heat treatment? Um, so heat is definitely a, a way to kill bed bugs as long as you can get to where the bed bugs are. That's always the real challenge with heat. So the Western, we do some chamber heating, like I showed in one of the slides there, where we can contain the items within a unit so that the heat can get to every single nook and cranny there. Um, we don't, at this point, do large-scale room heat treatments because there's a lot of variables with heat treatments in large-scale rooms. There's a lot of places bed bugs can hide, such as it, I, um, insulation in walls, insulation underneath carpeting, the, the padding that goes under carpeting. If the bed bugs can find a place that's uh, cooler than the the threshold they need to pass away from the heat, then they will come back out again and cause you continued problems. So if you can get to the areas where the heat is, heat is very effective, but if you can't get to those areas, that's what makes it challenging. So that's our sort of stance on heat. Um, someone asked, what was the name of the heating unit you mentioned that a suitcase can fit into? It's a thermostrike ranger. So thermo strike is this all one word, like thermo strike and then ranger is the name. I was told by my pest services that in the event that a canine found the scent, we should treat the rooms up below, right and left. Is this the usual protocol? Well, I would I would argue, and, and this is just based off of our protocols in our program, I would argue instead of just actually bringing a dog into one individual room, confirming an alert, and then treating uh, in an area, uh, what would be like clover leaf there, I would say bring the dog into multiple floors, above, below, side to side, and across the hallway, all at one sweep, um, to actually find exactly where they are, and then only have to treat the rooms wherever the dog alerted. So to me, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but the way that I'm hearing the question was the room above, below, side to side, and across the hall was not inspected, just the one room where there was an alert. And if that's the case, then we should have had the dog up, down, left, right, and across the hall as well as the other, the other rooms that are on that floor, just to make sure that we got all the spots where bed bugs are harboring. And um, a follow-up to that is, um, when should we ask for canine and when for uh, visual inspection? So the way that we like to have it set up is, if you have a canine program, it should be something that's happening on a routine frequency, quarterly or monthly, where the dogs are coming in proactively and inspecting all set of a block set of rooms or a full couple floors or the entire building. And that should be done routinely, regardless of what you're finding or not finding, just regular inspection, the proactive monitoring. Then, if there is, let's say, you have a, a, a housekeeper um, thought that they saw a bed bug or they brought evidence of the bed bug, at that point, you would want to bring in a technician for that isolated area to actually do a visual verification and make sure that what was seen was truly bed bugs so you can use visual in that, in that uh, circumstance. If you do not have a proactive canine program, then it's, it, it turns out to be a very reactionary structure just because you can't visually verify, or you can't visually look in all of the rooms in most hotels within a reasonable amount of time doing visual inspection. Another question, does bed bug registry have any process for verifying a complaint? How do you fight potentially false claims? What I have seen on bed bug registry, so, so to answer the question simply, the answer is I do not believe so. I don't know of any type of verification process that bed bug registry uses. It's basically a public forum where anybody can post a, a complaint or, or, or whatever. So no, they, we can't say that all of the complaints that are in there are truly, you know, even true, let alone verified. Um, that being said, it's, at the end of the day, when it comes to 
how that impacts reputation, it's, it's really irrelevant. It's still going to impact the reputation. One thing I have seen on Bedbug Registry is the individual hotels, um, the management teams are actually looking through Bedbug Registry to make sure that their hotels aren't getting complaints. And if there is a post of a complaint or a reported sighting, a lot of times I've seen them, and it's up to the individual hotel to make the decision, but they will respond to that complaint. And they'll state something of how they have dealt or addressed with the issue. Um, usually it's some type of an apology. We are sorry that this happened. However, you know, this is reality of what we're dealing with. And here are the steps that we took to resolve this situation. You should feel reassured that we are doing everything that we can within our bed bug protocols to manage this problem. And the same goes for any of the other online, you know, TripAdvisor, Yelp, or anything like that. The more that you can respond and show concern for whatever post was on there, the better off that your hotel is going to look overall. So definitely responding to those in a positive light is going to help. Um, does Western Pest Control have canines? Yes, we do. We actually have a, um, a separate department for canines. So none of our canines work for the individual branches. And the main reason for that is to keep a level of separation for ethics reasons. Our canine handlers do not, um, they're not incentivized in any way, shape, or form to find any bed bugs. And they don't have a, a, a branch manager or a supervisor or an account manager that's trying to get them to find bed bug problems so that they can sell bed bug treatments. So we actually do have a program. It is separated. It's, it's actually in my department, which is specialty services. Um, and so yes, we do provide We okay, just got another question. What is happening on the pesticide front? At this point, there haven't been any new chemistries in the past few years. In the last several years, we've been provided with some products that are kind of dual products, where there's two different products that individually work on bed bugs, but together they work better on bed bugs together. Um, so those are some things that we've seen in the last several years. But no like brand new chemistries for bed bugs have been for, that have showed up for our industry in the last few years. So we're always hoping there's something else coming out there. It is important to note though that the, um, the utilization of multiple different types of chemistries within a treatment protocol is vitally important. We do see in, in pockets, we do see resistance uh, concerns um, specifically to either pyrethroids. Now we're even seeing some, some concerns in, on neonicotinoid resistance, just two different classes of chemistry. So using multiple different chemistry classes to treat the problem will actually help with that resistance management pro um, uh, protocol. So don't want to just go in there with one product and say we solved the problem. Um, if you are experienced in that, ask the question, why are we using multiple products? Because there should be multiple different classes of chemistry that we use for effective control. Someone commented, uh, bed bugs were almost eradicated. Why can't they accomplish that again? They're, they were eradicated at one point in time because the chemistries that were available in the 40s and 50s were what were called broad spectrum chemistries. So if I got a call, if I was an exterminator and I got a call for, say, cockroaches, I would come and spray these broad spectrum chemistries and I would be controlling your cockroaches, your ants, your bed bugs, and it would last a really long time as well. They had a very long residual lifetime. The products that are available today, for very good reasons, is, um, it's less risk for people and pets and the environment. The chemistries that are available today are actually more species specific. So when you call me for, say, a cockroach problem, I'm coming out and putting a couple globs of bait. Maybe I'm using an IGR or something like that, but I'm not doing anything for your bed bugs at all. So we actually address, as, as an industry, we address each one of the individual problems separately, and that allows the products that we're using not to have the same high risk level of the products that we're using in the 40s and the 50s. And there's also been studies that have shown that there is resistance even to some of those chemistries that eradicated bed bugs in the United States in the 40s and 50s. There, there have been They've shown that there are populations of bed bugs that are actually resistant to things like DDT out there. So even though it worked in the 40s and 50s, they've adapted since that time, and it may not even work the same way, and we're showing that it hasn't worked the same way to eradicate them as well. If a guest is um, were to be bitten, is it possible to have a delayed reaction, for example, a week later? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my reaction is actually just like that. I'll, I'll feed my insects 
um, say today, and for the first three days, I don't show any bite reaction at all. And on the fourth day, I start showing some swelling. On the fifth day, it actually turns a little red. And somewhere between week one to week three, they actually turn into hardened nodules, probably the best way to explain it. So, yeah, the, the actual bite reaction can change over a period of time. Not only that, but it's also important to understand that my reaction and a lot of people's reactions can change over a longer period of time. And what I mean by that is when I started feeding bed bugs and I started working with them, it was actually before they were they came back to the United States on, our, on, a, on the level they are now. My first job out of grad school, I was a Navy entomologist, and we were dealing with bed bugs quite often. And if I got bit by bed bugs back then, I didn't show any signs of reaction at all. Over years of working with bed bugs and feeding these bed bugs, now I, my body has developed a sensitivity to the bite, and I actually show a really odd reaction. So yeah, they, the bottom line is that there is no way to tell whether or not just looking at a bite, that's a bed bug bite, not a bed bug bite, whether it happens early or late. Every individual person is going to react differently based on their own reaction body mechanisms like this. Is it a future concern that uh, bed bugs could transmit diseases like Zika? To this point, there has not been any documented cases of human-to-human -human transfer of any of the vector-borne diseases at all. Um, so we, we're we very confident still that there is no, uh, uh, well, there hasn't been any evidence of it, so there's nothing that's known as far as bed bugs being able to transmit anything. It looks like our uh, last question is if this webinar is being recorded, so um, it can be watched at a later date, and the answer to that is yes. Um, this webinar will be available on the Hotel Business uh, website after this is over, and uh, if there are no other questions or, or final thoughts, um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us, and I hope everyone found this to be a productive conversation. Thank you all, and, and have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm.